Reagan's and our next governor of this state of North Carolina, Pat McCrory. And he's going to answer all the right questions. That's the best introduction I've had all year. <laughs> You know, y'all have given me such a warm welcome since I just walked in the door and came into Asheville uh, just a, a few minutes ago. But one of the most unique comments I got, and i got to let you know what this comment was while walking around the tables um, right before I came up to the podium. One individual in the audience, he shall remain nameless, I'm pointing at him. He said, you know, there's only one thing I've ever disliked about you, Pat. And I said, what's that? He said, well, you remind me of my ex-wife's ex-husband. <laughs> I didn't know how to respond. <laughs> you know, it was kind of interesting too. I was up, I've been spending a lot of time in the West during the past several months, and I was up above Boone right at the Tennessee border a couple days ago, and we were right at a mountaintop, in fact, at a, at a cabin, a log cabin, which there was a one way dirt road to get there for two and a half miles. One way, by the way, when another car comes the other direction, it's a game of chicken on who backs up. And, uh, but I got there and we had a wonderful band and a wonderful event at this beautiful, beautiful oversight looking further west toward the Tennessee border. And I was walking around and I said, asked one guy, I said, now, did you grow up around here? He said, yes, sir, I did grow up right around here. In fact, I've only been out of state twice. One of them was to Tennessee and the other time I went to Charlotte. <laughs> So I'm collecting these quotes throughout the campaign trail that I'm enjoying. I've got two of the best ones in the West. Um, listen, these are very, very serious times. In fact, just a few minutes ago, the new unemployment statistics came out for the state of North Carolina. And I'm sad to report that our unemployment is still the fourth highest in the nation. The fourth highest in the nation. And in fact, we are now the state in which we have the 40th straight month in which our unemployment rate is over 9% in the state of North Carolina. The 40th straight month in which our unemployment rate is over 9% in the state of North Carolina. The only states we're beating right now in unemployment figures is Rhode Island, Nevada, and California. That's it. This is not the North Carolina that I remember growing up. As I grew up in Jamestown, North Carolina, went to college in Salisbury, North Carolina, got a job in Charlotte, and became a leader. I remember the North Carolina from the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, through the 2000s, where there was, there was no, no state ahead of North Carolina in anything. And the reason I'm running for governor is we're going to make North Carolina number one again. And it's not going to be number one, it's going to be number one. But and, and I come from business. I've been a business person for 30 years. And I'm proud of my business background. And I think there's an attack on business right now from the Washington and out of Raleigh. And we need to become more business friendly in North Carolina. And one thing I try to do is I try to pick the brains of people who've succeeded in business, both small and large companies. And I remember several years ago, I met a top CEO of one of the top 10 companies in the United States of America. And I asked him the following question, and it was a very direct question. I said, why has your company moved from number one to number two against your competition during the last two years? And he said, Mayor, that's a great question. Let me tell you what happened to us. Inside our headquarters, we were all turned inward. Depending that our brand would survive the ups and downs of the economy. And we're going to live off of our brand. And in the meantime, we're going to turn inward and worry about who gets what office, who gets what title, who gets what promotions. Who gets the blame? Who gets the credit? And we have all these internal turf battles within our company. 
And while we were turned inward talking to each other, our customer was leaving us, and we didn't even know it. I don't care what business you're in, if you turn your back to the customer, the customer will leave you or your competition will take your customer. And I've never forgotten that story because I think it reflects on what's happened in North Carolina government and leadership during the past decade. Under the leadership, especially out of the executive branch during the past decade. And that is this. I think inside the Beltline in Raleigh, We've had the current leadership, the past leadership for the past decade, turn inward and basically living off the great brand of North Carolina and assuming that brand would carry us forever. While there are internal bickerings of Republicans against Democrats, the House against the Senate, the legislature against the governor, and it seems as though everyone against small and large business alike. In fact, during that time, they increased the income tax, they increased the gas tax, they increased the sales tax, they increased the corporate tax. And what was happening while they were all turned inward, bragging about how great North Carolina is, and it is great, the problem was other states were changing and recognizing we're going to take action toward North Carolina, we're going to try to beat them in economic development. They were showing leadership, and that's been happening during the past three years. You know, I meet with Governor Christie of New Jersey. He came in in 2009, and by the way, when you meet Governor Christie, he's everything you see. <laughs> but you know, he made a commitment when he got elected is, listen, New Jersey is falling off of a cliff right now. Our unemployment's too high. Businesses leaving to other states, and we need we have far too high taxes. He cut the tax rate. He started communicating to businesses, seeing what they needed, and he cut some of the bureaucracy and had more efficient government. And guess what? Right now, we have a higher unemployment rate than New Jersey, right here in North Carolina. Surely, if they can do it in New Jersey, we can do it in North Carolina. I'm being very upfront with you. This is our competition across the United States and across the world. Nikki Haley in South Carolina, I meet with Nikki Haley, and right now they have beat North Carolina in several big economic development battles for new companies coming to North Carolina. And here North Carolina and the current governor and the past governor give all this upfront cash begging a company to come to North Carolina, while South Carolina has a long-term economic development plan, primarily having lower corporate taxes and lower income taxes, which companies can look at the long-term value over 10 or 20 or 30 years. And guess who, where the companies are going right now? Go, they can go right across the border to South Carolina. And that can impact Wilmington, to Charlotte, to Asheville. Or they can go right over to Tennessee, where Bill Haslam, Good friend of mine, former, former mayor of Knoxville, Tennessee, is now governor. And I'm telling you right now, they're trying to do everything they can to build a business base, and that includes stealing customers from right across the border in North Carolina. I know this as a mayor because during my 14 years as mayor of Charlotte, I looked at what my competition was doing, and my goal was to beat the competition, especially in job creation. And you don't just beat them by taking business from elsewhere. The way you beat them is to work with your existing customers and get them to grow. You know that as a small business person. You spend more time getting your current customer to grow your business, their business, as opposed to getting new customers. You do both, but you don't, you don't avoid your existing customer or take them for granted or turn your back to them. And I think that's what we've done in North Carolina government. Bobby Jindal, Louisiana right now, 39-year-old governor. When he got elected, he said, I'm going to end this corruption in Louisiana politics. We're embarrassed about being the butt brunt of jokes about the corruption in Louisiana. We know those jokes in Louisiana, right? In a short four years, and he was just re-elected with over 80% of the vote, Louisiana is no longer known for corruption in state government. In fact, they're becoming a very tough economic development recruiter in Louisiana. Surely, if 
They can do it in Louisiana. We can do it in North Carolina. Because North Carolina has so much to offer, from the mountains to the Piedmont to the coast. We have unlimited resources that we have to unleash. But it takes a governor to show the vision and strategy to get there on how we're going to unleash those resources and how we're going to put North Carolina back to work again. We've had that in the past among both Republican and Democratic lawyer, uh, governors in the past. But we have not had it in the past decade. And now more than anything, I think it's going to take an outsider to come into Raleigh and shake things up cut through the bureaucracy, cut down on the waste, look at our corporate and income taxes, and how we can make North Carolina more business friendly is going to be crucial to our economic survival here in this state. And let me just tell you a few of the things I want to do as your next governor, and it's going to be a battle between now and November to make that happen. The first thing we need to do is get North Carolina into the energy business. We've wasted at least four to five years sitting on the sidelines while other states look for gas exploration and oil exploration, while Pennsylvania, New York, Ohio, the Dakotas, and even Virginia is looking on how we can do exploration both offshore and inland to create jobs, but to also participate in the energy independence of our country. And you in Asheville know more than ever, when there's a gas crisis, you get hit first with high gas prices and long lines. I've been in your lines. I've seen the gas prices up there. When the lines disturbed coming up from Louisiana, you get hit first. We ought to participate in the energy independence of our country right here in North Carolina and create jobs. And right now, our current governor and, yes, lieutenant governor have sat on the sidelines on that issue. formed committees, formed commissions. It's time for action. Action which allows both exploration, but also action at the same time in which you have good environmental and regulation and ensure we know how the money is going to be spent and we do it safely and wisely. We could have been doing this for the past four to six years, but we didn't. As your next governor, I'm going to work with Nikki Haley, our competition, and Governor McDonald in Virginia, and Bill Haslam in Tennessee, and go, how can we form a sort of Southeast coalition? and convince Washington to also get off their rear ends and get us into the energy business. This is extremely important. It takes action. The second thing that I think is very important, and I'm hearing especially from small businesses, is regulations. And the sad news, a lot of these regulations are coming from Washington. In fact, there's a regulation that's being debated in the Supreme Court right now as we speak, and it will be the biggest news story in the United States in the next two weeks when the Supreme Court rules on Obamacare. The sad news is during this national health care crisis and the largest legislation that our nation has ever seen, our governor and her administration sat on the sidelines and refused to challenge the national health care system and refused to communicate with the people of North Carolina on what the alternatives might be and also what the impact on our Medicaid and Medicare and small businesses would be. And there's a tremendous impact on it right now. I know businesses, small businesses in North Carolina that have told me they are growing, they want to grow, but they refuse to go over 70 employees because then they'd have to be pulled into the Obamacare system. And yet our governor and our state stands on the sidelines and let others fight our battle. That is not the leadership we deserve with regard to regulations. And there are a lot of state and local regulations that overlap each other and are literally making small businesses, some with only 70 to 100 people, have three or four people on their staffs just to deal with regulations. We need a serious effort coming out of state government to go, what are the regulations that make sense? What are the regulations that we have on our books that are just creating work for government? And which ones are going to have long-term impact on the future of North Carolina's economy? We need some serious questions in this area. We cannot live off of our past brand. As in any business, we constantly need to change our brand and see what the competition is doing. The third thing I want to briefly talk about is this, and that's education. I have a passion for education. I got my teaching degree from Catawba College way back in the 70s. I even passed the, the teacher's exam here in North Carolina. My parents were pretty proud of that. At the time. I never got to become a teacher in the public school system, but I actually got a job with Duke Energy, and for seven of my 28 years, I was director of training and education 
for the seventh largest utility company in the nation. 15 to 20 years ago, we were doing long distance training. We were doing training through computers and self-learning with adult learning. We knew we had to adapt our curriculum every year to meet the customer needs. The dilemma we're having right now in education is we're again living on the past brand of our universities, of our K-12, and of our community colleges. All brands which have been good, but the fact of the matter is they're falling behind. Our dropout rate in our North Carolina high schools is over 20%. You know what happens to a kid that drops out of high school. He's going to be a burden on his family, a burden on society, and they're not going to be productive. And that's just inexcusable. And therefore, to ask you for me to raise your taxes to pour more money into the system is wrong because we need to first find out what are we doing wrong and we need to correct it. And if it needs more revenue, then we'll seek more revenue. But why don't we first find out what we're doing wrong and fix what we're doing wrong. <laughs> Same thing with our university system. Our university system, the costs are going up 7 to 8% a year when the rate of inflation is 2 to 3% at most. And yet for the past decade, the costs keep going up and up and up. And yet feedback from employers that I get throughout the state are, is this, is that when we get many of the graduates, they're not qualified and they don't have the skills needed to meet our needs. We have remedial training in reading and writing and math in K through 12, in our community colleges and our university system. You know, one thing I learned in business, you fix the problem at the front end so you don't have to repeat and spend more money at the back end. And yet we're spending all this money all the way through the process, K through 18, and putting people through a remedial reading and math and other courses. You fix it at the beginning as opposed to pour all the money in at the end. And in the long run, then we all save money and we have a better education system. There's one thing else I'm passionate about with regard to education. And I apologize if I offend any of the room because this may be politically incorrect. But it's time that we have straight talk with people in North Carolina. And that is this. I think there are two pathways to success for someone graduating from high school. The first pathway is to get, take a four-year college curriculum courses so you can get one of our great universities or small colleges throughout North Carolina. We have a lot of choices. And that's a, that's a pathway that I took when graduating from Ragsdale High School in 1974. But I think there's another pathway to sex, success, and that is the trade and vocational route. One of the biggest pieces of feedback I get are two things. One is employers are saying we cannot find the mechanics and electricians and people can fix things and repair things and innovate things. Because the 50 and 60 year olds are retiring and we can't find the 20 and 30 year olds to fill those jobs, even with an unemployment rate of 9.4%, we can't find them here in North Carolina. And yet there are people with that type of talent, which I respect, because it's talent I don't have. My wife reminds me of that all the time. <laughs> but it's a talent I respect. So therefore, I think we're forcing a lot of kids who have this talent into a curriculum and into kind of an elitist mentality that the only pathway to success is to go get a four-year college degree. I hear this from the president. I've heard this from our governor. I disagree. I think there are two pathways to success, and both of them are important to our future economy here in North Carolina. We've got to respect both pathways. And we will all benefit, and I think we'll reduce the dropout rate in North Carolina. If we don't put all this pressure and making someone, you know, wonder if at Ragsdale High School, someone would have made me take auto mechanic courses in order to graduate. I would have had a tough time. My dad was an engineer, and he always said, are you sure you're my son? You cannot fix, <laughs> fix mechanically. I, I don't have that mechanical aptitude. I respect that attitude, and it's desperately needed. And I want to help those people get those skills and get them jobs and get them into our two-year, what we used to call tech schools, to get it done, to meet industry needs. This is the way we need to think out of the box with regards to education. 
We cannot live off of our past brand, whether it's in our K through 12, our community colleges, or our universities. We're going to have to constantly change. Part of the reason is because there is no new money out there, and the other reason is our competition is changing. And I'm not going to lose to our competition. The last thing I want to briefly talk about is our tax system in North Carolina. One thing I've told you before in my 14 years as a mayor, I look at what others are doing to recruit and retain jobs. And the fact of the matter is our tax system is well over 40 years old. It hasn't been <coughs> taking bits and pieces out of it, but there's no strategic plan which interacts with what our long-term goals are in North Carolina employment. And I have a bias in employment. I firmly believe that not only our nation's economy, but also our state's economy, if it's going to be sustainable long term, we must have a bias toward those people that produce things, those people that make things, those people that grow things, and those people that innovate things. Because if we continue to make things as opposed to just buy things, then those industries grow and they provide money for the service industry, the travel and tourism industry, and also government workers and teachers and police and fire. But it doesn't go the other way around. You don't first grow government and then hope the private sector follows you. You grow the private sector. And then that provides revenue to hire the teachers and the police and the fire that you desperately need. That's the way our system works, but we've gone reverse. And the math doesn't add up, and neither does Economics 101 teach that. This is the type of thinking that I want to bring to the governor's office. We need a governor right now that has a vision, a strategy, and a cooperative spirit with Republicans and Democrats to make North Carolina great again, to put North Carolina first, because this is the best state. And uh, we're going to get that brand back. And it starts the day that we got the worst unemployment statistics that we can imagine for North Carolina. We've got the least growth rate in jobs in this report of any state in the United States today. And that is unacceptable, and we're going to change it. And I need your help. Thank you, and God bless you. Thank you. I'd be glad to take uh, any questions you might have, except for the one person who said I reminded him of his ex-wife's ex-husband's. Mayor McCrory, uh, Mark Hunt, Ashland City Council, we met on your way in. Thank you so much for coming here and speaking with us and being with us. Thank you for your service to the community, too. City Council, there's no place to hide as a city council. <laughs> I, did it, I did it for six years, so uh, thank you for your service. I will not disagree. <laughs> uh, I, I'd like to ask about some views you might have about municipalities. Sure. Reflecting on your time as mayor of Charlotte, I know you appreciate the special challenges that municipalities have North Carolina, more than most states, uh, have municipalities that rely on Raleigh to establish what the latitude for municipal uh, uh, affairs can be legislatively. And uh, Asheville has a particularly unique history and situation. We're a regional capital. We've got some great economic opportunity. We're challenged by some, some history and so on. But if you will, will you reflect on uh, challenges that municipalities face in dealing with Raleigh, what what your administration would view as, as initiatives that could help municipalities, and to the extent you got any reflection on Asher's unique situation, please share that with us, too. Thank you so much. That's a great question. I could spend two hours on that, and I won't, but uh, the first question is you've got to have, the first comment, the basics, you've got to have communications between the governor's office and mayors and county commissioners and school board members and see what's, because they're the closest to the grassroots and to the customer than anybody. And um, we have not had that type of communication. I, I was mayor of Charlotte for 14 years. I was never invited. I've never been to the governor's mansion before. I hear there's a nice one here, too. Uh, I'm looking to see him and being invited sometime. I've never been to the one in Raleigh, either. But um, the first thing we need to have is communications and dialogue, as opposed to treating each other as enemies, we need to treat each other as partners. The second thing I think it's very important for the next governor to do is one of the, your main jobs is to provide the infrastructure 
you have water and sewer and you have streets and you have airports and other needs that you must fulfill, I think we need to have a better integration into what your city's infrastructure plan and how that correlates with what the state's infrastructure partnership will be with you. And one thing I plan to do as governor is something I did as a mayor, and I will implement and, and present to the public a 25-year transportation infrastructure plan for the entire state. So people in Asheville know exactly where the future infrastructure will be built to help you recruit industry to this area and to help retain industry. And then the cities will also know where their integration of your local and city roads will be with other transportation needs. And right now there is no transportation vision for the state or infrastructure vision for the state uh, tying in the urban areas, the rural areas, tying in the mountains to the Piedmont, tying it into the coast, into the ports, even tying it into our competitive states, which we have to think about because interstate commerce is extremely important. I don't let the boundaries interfere with my thinking of cooperation with my competitors across the state. So those are two areas. The other area is unfunded mandates that state and federal government often put on local governments, where the state legislature or the the president or the Congress will all of a sudden say, we want to do the this, but we're not going to pay for it, but you have to do it now at the local level. Then you have to find the money from your local citizens and you have no input on it. And I know unfunded mandates and regulations and accepting federal money, but with all these strings attached that the federal government puts on it, a lot of times when you accept federal money, you end up costing you more than you get. In fact, I'm very proud of the legislature today just passed, let overrode governor's veto on an uh, effort that the community colleges actually asked for permission to get to refuse federal money if it's going to cost them more to accept it. The governor vetoed it. The legislature overrode that veto yesterday or today. And, you know, it's the community college presence that asked for that. Don't force us to accept federal funds if in the long term it's going to cause us more problems. This is the flexibility that I think the governor and the state legislature needs to give you. I want to decentralize a lot of our efforts. With county government, I want to decentralize a lot of the education efforts. I'm still trying to figure out what the bureaucracy does in Raleigh regarding education. Because if I talk to any superintendent of any public school system, they go, we really don't know what they do in the Department of Education in Raleigh. We just move on and try to do things ourselves and hope they get the heck out of our way. So I'm going to examine how much money are we spending on staff overhead in Raleigh before we uh, do any more uh, reduction of cost or, or that's where the money will go, back out to the field. Sorry, I use the term field. I come from a business. Move the money back to the field closest to the customer. Yes. Right. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I'm encouraged to hear about your highway uh, transportation infrastructure idea. How do you uh, intend to fund it? Especially since we've got fluctuating uh, gas tax, we've got alternative energies, we've got more cost efficient automobiles. Uh, how do you envision taking that next step to implement? Well, that's one reason, frankly, I want to get into the energy business because there's incredible potential revenue to get from the energy business, both offshore and inland, which I would put a large portion of that money into infrastructure. And because right now our infrastructure is short-sighted. The other thing is I'm going to try to not have uh, the last two governors have stolen from the Highway Trust Fund. I mean, just Governor Martin set up the Highway Trust Fund. The word trust was there for a purpose, <laughs> and it's just been taken. I mean, people have just taken from it uh, for the past decade to balance the budget in other areas. I also might add, I hate to say this, but uh, we've got to have direct talk. The state's in much more difficult financial shape than anyone's saying regarding government liability. If you own a small business, you've got to have all your unfunded liability on the books. The state's had its unfunded liability off the books. So the first thing I'm going to deal with as governor is we owe the federal government $2.3, $2.4 billion for unemployment insurance. The governor accepted that from the federal government, knew the bill would be owed in three years, but had no plan to pay it back. And now the plan to pay it back is we're taxing all the small businesses to pay for unemployment insurance. And we also have the fourth most um, friendly unemployment 
benefits of any state in the nation. I think it's fourth or fifth, at least in the top ten. I have the short-term thinking we've been doing in budgeting at this point in time, so I, I need to warn you, I need to put out the short-term fires first and deal with that.